Hey everyone, thanks for checking out the replay of the first home buyers webinar that we that we did. If you are watching this on YouTube or listening on the My Millennial Money Replay podcast, um, not all of the substance of the webinar are on the replays because we really want to make these webinars exclusive for those who join, uh, particularly around special offers. However, if you do want to have a look in the show notes of the podcast or in the YouTube comments, you might see a couple of little special offers. And just remember, if you are ready to buy uh, your first home, please speak to a mortgage broker first before you pull the trigger. And if you need help with a mortgage broker, you can click get help at sortyourmoneyout.com and we can refer you to somebody who's most appropriate to you. And thank you very much for listening and watching. And also on sortyourmoneyout.com, if you click webinars at the top, you'll see a variety of different webinars that are coming up. Uh, at the time of uh, me recording this, we've got some planned around uh, advanced property strategies. We've got a mortgage broker Q&A. We've got a personal insurance webinar. We've got a health insurance webinar. I don't think it's on the website yet, but that's coming up. And we've also got one for small business owners about finding your ideal client. So thanks again for listening and watching. And remember, jump in the Facebook group for some more conversation and we really want to make these webinars better. You'll notice that the tech isn't 100% nailed yet, but we are really planning on working this out. Thanks so much. I'm Glenn James. I'll see you guys soon. Bye. Shall we um, get into the basics? Let's let's, let's pluck it. this chicken. Let's roll. So, Talisa, is that how you'd say it? Tausa. Taisla. Taisla. I'm really sorry for not pronouncing your name correctly. Um, where do I even begin? And Karinya asked, where do I start? And then Nathan asked, what do I need to do to be able to buy my first home? So in terms of just some basics, I thought I would ask John and Rach, mm. just their two seconds mm. worth on, you know, how do we get started in this home buying journey? Because it can be daunting. Can be. Um, and it is. And it is. Yeah. So what's your take on this, John? Yeah. So I'll let Rach go off on, on her tangent with um, with borrowing because she's the most sophisticated uh, mortgage broker this side of Sydney. Um, I would focus on goals and strategies. So number one, knowing what we want long term, 8, 10, 20 years away and, and have a think about that if you haven't thought about that before. Um, to then bring it back to understand what we want in the next 12 months, two years. So whether that's living in your own home or rent vesting, um, you need to decide what that is and then location and then I would work through that eight-point strategy. So knowing if it's an investment, your yield, um, your location, um, all, all the buying entity, etc. If it was your own home to live in, then what type of property do you want for the next eight to 10 years because we don't want to be continually transacting in property because of the associated buying and selling costs. So that's where I'd head, goals and strategy for me. Yeah, goals and strategy. Now, race, uh, race, <laughs> Rach, <laughs> having a shocker tonight. It's all this, like it's overwhelming all this crap we've got here. You can see from the, anyway, there's all this tech happening, but that's no excuse. We're a professional bunch. So before we get into your thoughts on where we begin, can you just let us know, I guess, what your background is and what you're about? Oh, sure. So, <laughs> um, so I'm um, I'm the director of Sphere Finance. So we're a, a group of, of mortgage brokers. We're based on the Central Coast, and our job is, um, well, we work on behalf of a client with all the different lenders. So we go on the property journey with a client. So um, we, I've been doing that for about seven years, and yeah, we have a great group of group of brokers. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. So what would your kind of mm. comments be um, to John and I if you know, one of us were wanting to know how to get started on this home buying journey? I think the first step is to actually just take your head out of the sand and actually go and see a broker. So I don't feel like you need to be ready to buy before you actually ask someone's advice. Um, I think a lot of people spend time trying to get in a position to buy but if they spoke to somebody at the start of the journey, they may be doing the right actions to get in, you know, into a position to buy. So, can um, we get you to move that mic a little bit closer? Sorry, yes. <laughs> we just had some comments. <laughs> 
So, yeah, mm-hmm. do you want to just repeat that, Rach? Yeah, so just being, um, just go and talk talk to a mortgage broker and and find out what steps you need to take to get into a position to buy, um, whether that be saving or, you know, knocking out some of those little debts or you know, how much do I need to save and do I need to pay out this car loan first? Yeah. I think if you speak to somebody, even if you don't think you're ready, just to make sure that you are on the right track for you. Yeah, mm, it's a good point because you, you could often be more ready than you think. When, when you think you need to save your 20% or your, your income mightn't be enough or who knows, you won't know until you go and speak to Rachel or someone. Oh, that's right. And I've had I've had appointments with clients where they think they're, you know, trying to get on the next 12-month journey mm. and their parents have come to the appointment and then, then it's turned into something like, well, we might be able to help you into a property and, you know, they're buying next week where they yeah. think it might be 12 months down the track. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's important, like, not to listen to the noise like you'll have a lot of friends that might one of them might have heard a an old urban legend that you need a 20 percent deposit and you need mercury and venus to align Mm. Mm. um which yeah awesome if you if mercury and venus is aligned and you've got 100 grand in the bank awesome but there are a few ways to pluck a chicken but i guess i wanted to kind of say um to karina nathan and um talisa um you know, make sure your personal cash flow is nailed. Mm. So you've got good banking structures in place, you've got uh, your systems in place and you're, you're managing your own money well because later on tonight we'll, we'll talk about what the banks look at in mm. terms of, you know, good and bad things that people have in their bank statements basically. So get your own house in order first yeah, uh, and then really focus on that personal debt. You know, if you do have any consumer debt, like if you've got debt from another life, I say, you know, 10 years ago you went overseas and it's all on the credit card. Yes. Um, and that speaks to really getting your own finances in order anyway. Mm. Um, so that's that's what I would say. And then once you've got your kind of mindset like John was talking about, you know, I do want to buy a house. I think it's for me. Um, I don't want to buy the investment property. I want to do this. I want to do that. Then you get your own cash flow nailed. Then you can go and speak to Rage, and there'll be a lot of options. So mm. I don't necessarily think that um, you can't get a home if you don't have fifty grand in the bank account. If you don't have seventy grand in the bank account, and we'll talk about ways where you might have a really good income, and you can see that the mortgage repayment is the same as your current rent, but we need to understand that. There are two sides of the coin. There's the income and the deposit, and we'll cover all of that uh, tonight. So if we go back to our agenda, I've got a bit of paper here. We're going to go to um, grants. So if I get Nate to put that up. So bear with us. We're, again, we're all always trying to do these things better, and we're looking at um, grants, and I'm just testing this. So I wanted to just kind of run through um, just the national grants that are available, like the state-based grants Mm. all around Australia. I think it's important to note that, uh, number one, this here is available to everyone in Australia, whether you're a first-time buyer or not. Now, I don't want to spend too much time here. We did a podcast episode on this uh, on, I think it's on My Millennial property and my millennial money express so Mm -hmm. um this is available for those who might be pulling the trigger uh buying a new place um or probably not renovating if you first home buyer but you've got to buy the property first and renovate it so it might be a bit much in six months uh but that 25k is available and who knows they might extend it stuff's been extended before and they might not Mm. so let's start here uh new south wales so there's 10 grand available. And if this is incorrect, uh, blame John because I got it off his <laughs> website. Uh, so you've got your 10 grand uh, if you're buying or building new. Um, and then you've got your stamp duty. Um, you know, if you buy up to 650K, there's no mm-hmm. stamp duty. Yep. Uh, Queensland, you know, 15 grand, no stamp duty. And again, we're going to run through these fast. Victoria, 10 grand. Now, John, speak to us about this um, 10 to 20 grand, which is pretty much ending tonight anyway or tomorrow. But speak to us about the regional Victoria grant. Yeah, so that is incorrect. Um, the 20K, I think uh, they've extended that another 12 months. So that that now goes through to 2000 and 
21. But, um, yeah, essentially if you're outside of the Melbourne metro area, you qualify for the 20K um, grant instead of the 10K. So, right. yeah, a lot of, lot of people are strategically thinking, well, I might just move an hour from Melbourne for 12 months. And do we know, John, if um, I can use the regional as well as this one here? Uh, the twenty k plus the yes. ten. No. Okay. So sweet. it's twenty uh, as opposed to the ten. Yeah. yeah. Sweet. Uh, as you can see there, Tasmania. They're not giving you all the stamp duty, uh, but you will get a bit of a cash um, mm. injection. Mm. And again, you just need to look at your state based revenue websites. Yeah. Okay. And again, the mortgage broker that you speak to at the time will help you through this um, ACT. Um, probably because they're all wealthy public servants and, you know, you can buy your own bloody house without yeah. our help. Um, hello, if you're watching. I know our friend Hannah in uh, the ACT is watching. She's been on the podcast. Yes, so she has. She's just moved down there and got a, a new job. Hello, Hannah. Um, so, yeah, there's some things there. NTs, 10 grand. So I guess what we're seeing is um, there are options all around Australia, mm. okay? So most of the time if you're a first home buyer, uh, there are government grants available mm. um, wherever you are. Yeah, no, it's um, it's pretty cool. WA yep. have just introduced a, a bit of a kicker from the state as well, which is yeah. Yep. So I just did everyone see that? I just sent an eighth cut. Yeah, cut. Yeah. All right. So lots of grants out there and lots of free money, and and I guess it's so important. And we will talk about strategy uh, a bit later, John. Mm. Answer some questions about well. Is it better if I buy elsewhere and forego the grant? So what I want to talk about now is what do we want to talk about? Parental guarantees. Yeah. So, Rach, can you just give us a bit of a vibe on parental guarantees? <laughs> what are Absolutely. they? Absolutely. You're, and our, you're our parent. Is you're our parent. And, and if yeah. you want a an iPad to draw... Absolutely. So we'll give the iPad to Rach. Do you want to hold your mic? And John will hold the microphone. And sure. This is pretty uh, so technical. Right, before right up draw, close. So, so essentially parental guarantees are, <laughs> you might have to stand up. are when you, I guess, don't have to save to buy a property and you might have a small deposit or no deposit, but your parents help you get into a property. Um, and something really important to talk about with parental guarantees is that it changes with the lender. So some banks might do a full guarantee where they want to use the parent's whole property and some banks will do a limited guarantee and that's usually preferable for the parents because if you are getting help from your parents, you want um, you want to make sure it's beneficial for you both. But just to give you an example of what a parental guarantee looks like, you might be buying a house and that house might be worth, let's say, 500000 and to not have lender's mortgage insurance you can't borrow more than 80% of the value of the home. So that's 80% before you pay lender's mortgage insurance. So the bank will lend you essentially the entire amount for the property, but they secure it against two properties. And that first will be your property. And because we can only go to 80%, there's 400 of your loan is secured against your, your, your property. And then your parents have a property here. And let's say your parents' property is worth 1 million. And they might have gone to their bank and they think that they can't do a parental guarantee because they've already got a mortgage with a particular lender that doesn't do parental guarantees. Let's say they've got a new they've got a loan for here at a credit union for five hundred thousand. And they may believe they can't do a parental guarantee. So there are some lenders that will do a second guarantee, what's called a limited guarantee, and they will put the hundred thousand that you need behind your parents' first mortgage. So you've got a loan of 500000 together, but 400 secured against your home and then 100000 is secured against your parents' home. So it's it's like an equity share where your parents are helping you um, you know, get in using property but not income or yeah, anything like good. that. So it's, a- it's fair to say, Rach, that all the risk is with the parents and not with the person buying the home. Ab- oh, absolutely. But it's also important to know that you're, you know, when we sit down to talk to some parents that were doing a parental guarantee or, or thinking about that, um, I mean, they'd also want to know that, you know, 
you know, they know their children more than anybody. So what, what's mm-hmm. your savings pattern? What's the plan? Is it affordable? So you're sort of talking to to everybody involved in the transaction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I would say uh, for the parental guarantee thing, it's like it doesn't solve all your problems. I mean, and it goes back to like you need to work out how to manage your, your money first because sure, you could get into a home tomorrow with a parental guarantee, but if you don't have your money managed correctly and your habits nailed, Absolutely. you'll end up back in debt which is dodgy anyway because it's like, well, I'm borrowing money but I still owe money to my parents and it can be a little bit messy. Yeah, for sure. But I would say that if your ducks are in a row from cash flow management point of view, where there's a will, there's a way. So if you're thinking strategically outside the box, a parental guarantee can be um, really beneficial as opposed to saving a deposit for the next five years. Oh, uh, it could and, be life-changing. Uh, I've got clients yeah. that would have bought with a parental guarantee five years ago that may mm. still be saving now and look what's happened in the market in the last five years. Yeah, so if it was in Sydney or Melbourne or a lot of other places, Absolutely. they might have even doubled their money as opposed to not being in the market at all. That's right, and it's important mm. to note that guarantee stays in place until your property stands alone equity-wise. Yeah. So it may not be for the life of the loan and you know, people that have done parental guarantees five years ago you know, in New South Wales, they may not still have that guarantee in place because of what's happened with the market. Mm. Can I give an example? If I grab that iPad off you, I just want to draw because a lot of you will need to explain this because your parents might be keen, but they might be also concerned about the practicalities and how I've explained it to my clients. And t- and I'll do this. If it, I use the 500k even if the parents own their house worth 500k and you wanted to buy a house worth 500k and you had the 20% deposit or 100k of the new mortgage against the parents 100k of their property does that make sense so far if for example you didn't pay your mortgage and they booted you out okay and the bank will then sell the home now, if the house sold for five hundred and ten thousand dollars, no issue. They release the parents. Okay, that's right. So if the markets go up, but I think the whole twenty percent deposit thing is because if the value decreased, mm. so if the value did decrease, uh, decrease, and then they kicked you out because you didn't pay, then it sold for say four hundred and fifty k. The bank, you still owe the bank fifty k. But mm. you don't because they've got the security from half of the house, mm. they, most of it. Then they're going to say to the parents, hey, you need to give us 50 grand mm. or we're going to put a court order in and sell your house. That's right. And that's and that's a reason why it's really important to choose a lender that if you are going to do a parental guarantee, that we'll do a limited guarantee mm. because you know there's a difference in how much your parents are actually risking too. Yeah, That's right. And so I, I think... To be honest, I think the risks are pretty low, but worst case scenario, we need to, like if if you didn't pay and you got kicked out and the bank's knocking on the parents' door, well, the parents will probably just remortgage their house and pay it off and they would be just pissed off with you forever. <laughs> but it's not as if that they put a, a hold over the whole property and want to sell. Well, it probably depends on lenders, right? Some lenders would. Yeah, that's really? right. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and that's where you need to get strategic, don't you? And you do. Again, good broker in your corner mm. to make sure that you choose so, yeah, the right lender. So, yeah, you, if you're learning, you know, the one thing already, and I've just learned this, talk to, you've got to see a mortgage broker that is dialed in to say we're going to set up a parental guarantee and not put a hold if possible over the whole parent's house mm. just a portion that they're using absolutely and there's been cases where the parents have said no to a parental guarantee in the past mm. because they've been to their bank and realized that they could only do one and they've got two children right but then there might be another lender that will allow you to do two okay so if there's yeah. two spawn yes and <laughs> And then both spawn like there's a set of twins, yes. you know. We're twenty, we're both twenty four, and we want to like get a parental guarantee and blah blah blah. Parents own the house outright. There will be banks out there that will allow a guarantee for each child. There will, yes, yeah. sweet. And um, parents obviously wanting to take some involvement in this process and not be blasé about the fact that uh, little Jimmy's going to buy the property. Um, yeah, go and do your thing, uh, but not understand the type of property or the market that they're buying into so that they can actually limit the risk by understanding the strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the parental guarantees that we've done, I would say that the 
the parents were clients of ours first. Yes. yes. And they might, you know, be investors or, or something. Yeah. They've come to us to say, tell me how I can help my kids get into property. Would and and would you recommend they set up a, an agreement with their son or daughter in respect to that or just the parental guarantee is fine? They, they don't have any... Or that would be their personal choice. Yeah. But um, I mean, some I, I haven't. I actually don't think I've had an experience where there has have been a proper guarantee that yeah. they, or a, an agreement they've done between themselves. I think it would be the unwritten law. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think it, it's important to note, like, I think as a, a respecting the relationship, if you are uh, engaging your parents uh, to be a guarantee on a property, I think it would be wise to say, "Hey, puppy and mummy, I want to, you know, use your property you've offered, but." I want to respect that. So he's, here are some things that you could take to your parents. You could say, okay, number one, I'm going to get, or myself and my partner, we're going to get uh, income protection insurance. So if either of us couldn't work, we've you know got our big person socks up or whatever, and we're doing what we can. Number two, it's going to be our priority to continue to save and if the, va- the value of the property increases over time, it is our absolute priority to release yes. you from us. And three, I think it would be just double check. Like you don't want to be rocking up in a brand new BMW the next week and saying, oh, you like my car, mum and dad, when it's like, well, hang on, you said you got no money. Why did we guarantee? So yeah. I think you just have to be intentional and just let your parents know that, hey, we're going to get insurance. So if something happened... Uh, you might even talk when you do your wills and your estate plan to go, there has to be a portion that goes back to mum or dad if we died. Like you just have to cover all bases. And I mm. think having a mortgage broker that's dialed in to yeah. chat with will help coach the situation. Yeah, and sometimes we have you know, conversations with parents separately. It's really yeah. more comfortable for them to have a conversation without who they're guaranteeing just to really talk through you know, all of the what would happen if. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think the, the the fear is, like I just drew, if you can go to the iPad, Nath, I think the um, a lot of the fear is the parents not actually understanding how this actually works. Yeah. Their, their whole house may not be covered. It might be just their yeah. living room and their lounge room that's uh, security. That's right. And it's it's important to, um, to, to chat with the broker mm. because – there could be plans that the parents want to relocate in the future. So can the lender that the broker thinks is most appropriate reposition the the, the guarantee? Yeah, and, and that and that can be done, yep. but it's different between lenders, which is really mm. important when you're sitting down to talk to the borrower, but you also talk to the parents that are guaranteeing to think what their goals are in the next five years and what their plans are Yeah, um, and if that's going to fit. Mm. So, Rach... I know the answer to this from your point of view because I've seen you work, um, but you'd be looking at the lender on the way in as well as potential on the way out with a refinance because some banks are refinance a little bit easier than others, don't they, when it comes to uh, to valuing properties and, and getting someone off the loan and refinancing to another lender. Absolutely. So, I mean, our goal is to get the, the parents obviously released as soon as possible mm. and that would be two things, which is one of them is the loan being paid down naturally but also when the, the property goes up in value. So we have clients that are buying homes with using a parental guarantee and and renovating and saying, please come value our property. When can we get mm. our parents released? And that might be 12 months or it might be five years, but yeah. it's, a, it's our job to, you know, make that happen as quickly as possible. Yeah. yeah, and I think if you are the parent and if someone's replaying this to your parents, firstly, what up? Welcome to my money or money. <laughs> Secondly, um, there's no – you have to go into this deal with the mindset of that guarantee might not ever be released until the property sold. Absolutely. Yeah. Like and, it's not the property goes up every two years and we'll get them released next year. Like it's just no. – I've done it's one that's been sh- a year and I've also done one that was still in place 10 years later. Yeah. yeah. And and taking the emotion out of it because obviously with family it is emotionally driven a lot of the time so we've just got to see the raw numbers and the risks associated, don't we? Yeah. That's right. Um, so any final words to people considering parental guarantee? Um, I guess with the parental guarantee, some of them, some clients would be in a position to buy, so they've saved their deposit, and we're all sitting down, and they, you know, they've got their ten percent saved, and it might be the parental guarantee isn't necessary, but it might be in place to avoid lenders' mortgage insurance. Yes. And another one is one of the grants that we didn't mention earlier is the new, the 
I guess that first home buyer, one where there's a guarantee from the government where they're they're paying, you can have the 5%, they're Low paying deposits. the mortgage. Yeah. We've it's actually got policy. dedicated slides for that. I'm not going to go any further then. <laughs> no. but, but, You're but people who work in doing French now, guarantees are going to go there. We're going to have yeah. a bit of fun. Um, I'm going to launch a poll. Now, I don't know if we can show you um, the response, um, but can you see that poll? So have a look. So... Okay. Oh, you're all answering it pretty fast. A live poll, eh? A live, there's nothing like a live poll to get your Monday night happening. So, so the question for those who are listening on the My Millennial Money replay podcast. So we've now, for those uh, watching, if you want to listen to this replay, we've got another podcast called My Millennial Money Replay. So any webinars that we do, the audio will be on there. Uh, the question is, how much of a deposit do you have? Uh under 20,000, there's about 30% of you. Uh, 21 to $40,000, there's about another 30%. Um, 41 to 60K, there's 15%. And then there's, wow, 30% of you have over 60K saved. Ooh, wow. That's amazing. Excellent well saving. Killing it. And I guess what uh, jogged me with this uh, poll rage to, to do it was um, can you use a blend of a parental guarantee and your own Absolutely. savings? Absolutely you can. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, so there you go. One I, one I got last week was actually do I go parental guarantee plus my own savings and lending and just have my own name on the title or do I buy with my partner without the parental guarantee? So we're talking – uh, relationship advice uh, because, you, like, is it too early to buy with my partner, etc. So Yes, and there's cases where the parents will offer the guarantee if it is you buying on your own yeah. but may not be as keen if if it is a buying with your partner. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Wow. Ugh. So there we go. I, d I can't display the poll results. Um, share results. Yes, I can. There you go. Look at that, everyone. Put that in your poll and smoke it. <laughs> P-O-L-L. -L. <laughs> Now, let's now move on. Actually, while we're in the spirit of polling. Um, we're going to the polls. We're going to the polls. Just as a bit of a, because I think we're warmed up. I've cooled down after the stress of yeah, you know, yeah. the webinar starting and Glasses getting recorded. Glasses have defogged and we're ready to go. <laughs> thanks, Nath. And thanks to Nath for working back tonight. True. He's done a great job. Yeah, he's a soldier. Soldier. Um, so let's launch this poll. When are you ready to buy, do you think? So, so cool, isn't wow. a live poll? I love a live poll. Yes. Should be more of them. Sh should be. Look at that. So just I'm going to give you five more seconds. Five, four, three. So the poll for those playing at home or watching the replay or whatever that you might not be able to see, uh, when are you ready to buy? 33% of you said within six months. 38% uh, said within the next 12 months. And then there's 30% uh, or 29% of you just here for the inspiration. So it's I think a nice there's spread, isn't it's it? a nice spread of people. Mm. Um, and I suspect Rachel and her team at Sphere might have a few phone calls uh, this week to chat to some people. <laughs> Get some pre approvals in place. So I want to now move on. Um, to another poll, but we don't have any more. <laughs> we might just do a webinar on polls. Oh, I'd love to do one. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about the First Home Super Saver Scheme. And if we can go to the trusty iPad, uh, this was announced a couple of years ago now. And I'm basically, and again, because everyone's situation is so different, I actually want to just draw stuff so you can get the key concepts in your mind. And then when you... Uh, are ready to buy or whatever, you can then talk to the broker or I'd probably even suggest chatting to a financial advisor if you need some information on this directly or to your own personal super fund. So your super fund, you'd probably give them a call and say, how does it work? And they'd probably give you some info, but you're going to get a good explanation tonight. So let's pretend this is your current super fund here. And we'll just assume you've got 20 grand in it. Okay, you might have more, you might have less. Here is your job and you get paid and then you get tax taken out 
and then your net income goes into your bank account, okay? And then out of your bank account, you might pay rent, you might pay food, just all your day-to-day expenses, okay? And then your work pays you 9.5% super into your super fund and they tax you at 15% on the way in. So that's how everyone's set up ordinarily, okay? So then we might say, okay, so how does the first home super savers can't even speak, but whatever. How does the first home super saver scheme work? And there's not an S missing because it's just called that. Um, How it works is you can elect your employer to put money into your super fund before tax. So pre-tax is a salary sacrifice. And then you can't put more than 15K in per year. Now, you can also put money from your own bank account into your super account and that money just is growing in your super account. So this whole system is, it's a big flush of money, okay? Just to go round and round. And then when you're ready to buy, you withdraw the money. You can't take out your normal 9.5% super. It's only above and beyond. Now, the money that comes out is taxed at your marginal tax rate but there's a 30% offset applied, okay? So this whole system is to basically flush money into your super account. If your superannuation investment has tanked um, the day before that you go to pull it out, there's a system in place where they add in a nominal interest charge. So they will deem an investment return even if the share market in your super fund has decreased. So there's no issues there. A couple of issues with this one is we've talked about the money out, uh, there's a 30% offset. You can only get the money out through the scheme or retirement. Mm. So that's why it goes to strategy. Mm. If you're unsure whether you want to buy a first home or not, if you're unsure, this scheme might not be for you Mm. because once the money goes in there, you can only get it out for the scheme or any other ways to get money out of super. Death, disablement and retirement. So that's a bit of a catch there. Now, the interesting thing is part of this scheme is you can't be an existing homeowner Mm. to use this scheme. So the trap is make sure you contact the ATO and request that you want the funds before you sign your house contract Mm. because technically if you go and go, yeah, I want to buy that house, sign the contract, before you told the ATO that you want to withdraw the money, yes. you've technically just already had your name on the title of a property. Mm. So it's it's a there's a bit of nuance with this yeah. scheme. So you don't have to do your tax return. You just have to notify them. You've just got to notify the ATO. because So if you went and signed a form, so yeah, I'll buy that house. Oh yeah, I'll get my deposit from the ATO. Then you go to the ATO. You can't get the money out mm. because you're already a house owner. Wow. So the money is now stuck in super mm. until you're retired. So speak to, you know, you've got to get your insurances sorted anyway before you buy a house, like your income insurances. Go to sortyourmoneyout.com, click get help, and I'll refer you to a financial advisor to sort out your, your income insurances at least. Then you can chat to them about this scheme. But yep. there's a few layers here. You just really want to make sure your strategy is lined up. It can be problematic for auctions as well. Because as soon as you go to the auction, the hammer falls. Puppy wants his money. Locked in. Should I stop saying puppy? Uh, keep it going. Yeah, okay. keep, keep it Yeah, yeah we'll, <laughs> we'll do a neutral. poll. No, we won't because it's going to be no. Um, <laughs> and then you can all, also get a, 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 some advice from a conveyancer about the process. Now, mm. just while we're on that and while I have a sip of my licorice tea, um, Rach, broad brushstrokes, what's a conveyancer do and when are they used in the process? Um, so a conveyancer or a solicitor acts on your behalf when you're buying a property and their job is to give you some advice around the different legalities and check the contract and make sure everything's in order for you to, um, to, you know, to buy a property that you want to be buying. Yeah. So basically if there's a hole in a contract that's big enough for a truck to drive through it, you've got a third party who's in the world, in that contract world, who's a registered property Mm. contracts person 
who can just talk you through the uh, the detail. That's right, and review yeah. the contract in full and yep. to make sure that everything is in is in order in the contract. Yeah, yeah, and, and generally speaking, people ask me, "Why do I use a conveyancer or do I use a solicitor?" Well, generally, conveyancers are doing this day in day out for the last. 10 years, so it's their specialty. Absolutely. Um, there's a good chance that a solicitor covers a whole range of different uh, roles and will probably charge you more. Yeah, and, and as long as that person comes recommended because they mm. are doing something you know, quite big in the transaction for mm. you. So conveyance rule solicitor if they're highly totally. recommended. Yeah. So, so basically don't sign anything until you speak to your conveyancer. That's right. So just on the practical side of it, you could go to the real estate agents. Offer, I don't know what it's like in every state, so excuse my ignorance. Uh, you could go, yeah, conceptually, I want to buy that property, put an offer in, sign the little one pager with the real estate agent, and what is it, a point zero point two five percent deposit? Yeah, so a couple of grand mm -hmm. that's right to the real estate agent just to go. We'll take you know conceptually hold the property for us. Then don't sign anything else until the real estate agent sends the contracts to your conveyancer. Mm. That's right. I would always suggest suggest talking to a conveyancer well before yeah. you do sign that initial contract. Sure, sure. But absolutely, it, yep. it happens where they, they're meeting the conveyancer and us yep. after they've signed a contract and they're in a five day cool off period. Wow. Yeah. So again, it's just about not recommended. It. No. <laughs> and if you are after a conveyancer, a couple of things you can do. You can ask your mortgage broker because you want to be chatting to the broker throughout the process right. anyway mm. and you would like most mortgage brokers would know some good conveyances in their world. That's right. Now, Jen, just on that, yeah. uh, it's important to note that uh, generally speaking, they need to be, well, they need to be licensed in that state. So if yes. you're buying into state, you can't use your local conveyancer unless they're registered for that state that you're buying in. I was mm. almost going to say I love you, John, but that would be too much um, mm. right now. But I was going to ask because Rach can – well, like your team has clients all over Australia. Mm. That's right. So we had to get a relationship with a conveyancer in, in Melbourne right. because our New South Wales conveyancer obviously couldn't mm. you know, right. work with those yeah. those buyers. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. So again, if you want to speak to, we'll have Rachel's <clears throat> details if you want to start to have a bit of a discussion about how much you can borrow because that's also important to know, isn't it? It's like I just want to know we've got, you know, 20 grand saved or we've got 10 grand or we've got yeah. 30 grand. 30% of you have 60 grand saved. Um how much can I borrow? Mm. And what type of information would someone need to give you for your team to work out some basic serviceability? Yeah, so generally um, like an initial fact find is what we send out. So it, it, that covers you know, what, your, what your income is but also what your expenses are and, you know, what debts that you have and, you know, how many dependents you have. And then we look at obviously your bank account statements to, to work out, um, you know, your expenditure your income, um, and that might differ between whether you're you know, employed with a salary or some people have a combination of self-employed and employed mm. and some people might have overtime. So all the banks look at that differently. So we just gather all of that information and then start to work out what you can borrow across all the lenders. Great, mm. great. Now let's go back to the slide. So let's have a look now at the first home loan deposit scheme. Now this is my favourite in the way that it was a last minute <laughs> – Scotty from marketing. Let's get um, <laughs> let's get one last little jab before last election. Yeah. Um, you know, big news headlines. Yeah. You know, not many people can use it, so that's cute. Um, so they've just issued another ten thousand, haven't they? As on the of first of July tomorrow. Well, yes. What's that? Wednesday. Um, yeah. Hot tip on that. Yes. We've just found out that the one that's going the the new ten thousand that are going to be released on the first of July. You actually need your notice of assessment. Right. To apply. So the nineteen twenties. Yes. Wow. So get your tax returns done nice mm. and quickly. Which you should yeah. be doing anyway, shouldn't well, you? Well, but yeah. that speaks Let's back to my first point. Have your own house in order. Yeah. Yes. So if you want to buy a house and the broker says, Hey, we need your tax return done mm. and you don't you might not have the time to wait three weeks for an accountant to do it. Mm. So right. just start to get your ducks in order. But talk to us about, you know, high level, the first home loan deposit scheme, what it is, how it works. Mm. Me? Yeah sure. yeah, sure. We'll put the slide up. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically uh, there's only a, a, an amount that's um, been released by the government to get basically people into first homes quicker um, essentially. 
Um, they need to have 5% of genuine savings. Yes. So by genuine savings, they need to see that coming into your bank account don't you, on a regular yeah, basis to, to make sure that it's in there. Um, and then they'll waive the, the LMI on uh, on that amount, won't they, right up to 20%? Yep. Um, how am I going? Yeah, that's yeah. really good. Really good. <laughs> I shouldn't have put um, you on the spot for this. No, no, I'm cool. Um, the majors have taken most of them, haven't they? The majors have taken most of the uh, What do you mean majors loans? just for those? <clears throat> so the major banks. Oh, there's been a spread. So at the end okay, of Okay, I'm wrong. So sorry. <laughs> so at the at the start, so what some of the majors got the first mm. the first lot, but they ran out and afterwards there was the really small lenders still had some left. So we found ourselves using lenders that we hadn't used for a very long time for right. that grant. Okay. Mm. There you go. You finish that then, if you want. <laughs> so essentially, what it is is, is you have your five percent deposit, <clears throat> and before, if you had a five percent deposit, you'd actually need more because you'd also have, you know, the the three percent lenders mortgage insurance on top. So you, if you're buying a house for six hundred thousand, you may have needed fifty thousand deposit, mm. even to do the maximum lend with maximum mortgage mm. insurance. And with that grant, you can have just the five percent. So on a six hundred thousand dollar purchase, that's Thirty thousand dollars deposit, and the mortgage insurance. So the lender's mortgage insurance that you would have paid the the bank to secure them against the risk of you would have been up to twenty thousand dollars. And now you don't pay that. Um, but it's quite. There's a lot of complexities around getting the grant, and a lot of people don't want to wait. So in talk a queue to us to about the the, um, the interest rate and where that sits in comparison to if I had twenty percent deposit, for example. So if you're lending 95% of the value of a property, whether you're using this grant or not, you're a higher risk to the bank and a lot of them will have different discounts on their rates, whether it be 95% and you would get a sharper rate if it was 80% and sharper again if it was 60. Mm. But obviously first home buyers, it would be very rare to be 60%. But um, some lenders will do 95% without without you know changing the rate up. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to note like a lot of people go, oh, why do I need a mortgage broker when I can just go to onlinebank.com because they've got the best rate advertised? Well, usually like the ads on TV, like 1%, I'm being dramatic, but like really low sharp mortgage rates advertised. Sometimes they're for loans that have over 20% of a deposit, which usually doesn't um, help a first home buyer mm. who might be using you know, 10,000 or 10% deposit and then the lender's mortgage insurance um, for the other side. Now, I think it's important that we talk about lender's mortgage insurance. Uh, I'll be really succinct with this, succinct. Basically, Rach touched on it before about the risk. So there's a risk to the bank that um, they might not be able to get their money back if one, you don't pay and they've got to sell it and the property value is reduced. But if you've got, I'll be dramatic, if you pay 50% deposit and 50% loan, the risk of the bank is really low because if you don't ever pay, the chance of the property being worth half is really low. Mm. So they'll be able to get their money back. So it's all based on risk. Now, they say, that's cool. You don't have a 20% deposit. You can put in 5% or 10%, but we want you to get insurance to protect us. So if you don't pay, we will then have the insurance policy that will pay the bank back. Mm. So the lender's mortgage insurance, it's lender's mortgage insurance. It's not uh, I can't pay so they'll pay me and then I can pay the bank back. No, it's to protect the bank. And a couple of years ago, there was a report on 7.30 on ABC where someone had this, they got kicked out of the house and then the lender's mortgage insurance company went back and sued the person who owned the house because they wanted their money. Mm. So. It's it's fraught with danger if you're not well informed. So broad brush strokes, broad brush strokes, speak to your mortgage broker about um, the FHM LDS. Um, the government like to give everything little acronyms, they do. don't acronyms. they? Um, I think just on that, um, it's important that they have got their ducks in the row with approval uh, because that. If they get uh, that approved, that can expire pretty quickly. If you haven't got your pre-approval and you haven't got your house, you're Absolutely. back to square one. So we've got a number of clients that are sitting in the queue for this grant that missed out in February. Mm. Um, now, when they do, they've 
when they do actually have an approval come up, they've got 90 days mm. to find a property. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really important that everything's it, their ducks are in a row by the time the new grants come out because yeah. you literally have 90 days to find a property. Mm. But it's hilarious. So it's like the government, it just... They just make it so complex, like the super thing. That one's really complex. The maximum you can really save is about five grand in tax, mm. right? Mm. And then this first home loan deposit scheme, they'd be better off just to roll out a blanket first home deposit, uh, a first homeowner grant, smooth it out. Let's just assume an extra five grand for everyone. Mm. Like let's just smooth it out and make it bloody easy yeah. and not, you know, the government gets involved. I, someone said in America, it was like an old president, he's like, the worst thing that um, the government can say is, hi, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Like it's just <laughs> – so yeah. we might now um, move on to some juicy questions. Uh, let's talk about rent vesting and we d- I think we're doing pretty good for time and if you need John, uh, if you need the pen and paper, a.k.a. Mm. iPad, yes. Jordan asks – Oh, and just put your hand up if you're finding this valuable so far. Just a little raise of the hand. Okay, sweet. Well, there's hands, so that's that's a good. couple. Yeah, it's good. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks, Ella. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, Anna. But like, there's hundreds of you. Um, so yeah, and I'm learning lots and being encouraged as well. So Jordan asks. Um, owner occupier versus owner investor as a first home. If we don't have a set place to settle with work, uh, with contracts changing frequently, so it could mm. be like medical professional, it could be army person, it could be uh, sales person, yeah, whatever that is. John, when you have clients that are in this, oh, what do we do? We know we want to start to invest in the future. There's some serious money on the table with all these bloody grants. Yeah. Like, what do we do? Yeah, as you say, Glenn, like I think in the last couple of months or definitely the last month, things have changed a little bit in respect to the the government grants. So for the first home buyer, it's it's up to 55, 60K that they can be either saving or getting rebates on. So that has changed the way we're thinking around someone's strategy to buy their own home as opposed to buy an investment. So that, that's not just to say, well, let's take advantage of it and, and just buy anything. There's still got to be some strategy around it. But um, it's it's really, it's a great question by Jordan because if he's uh, or she's um, transient in their employment and they're only going to be in one place maybe two, three years with a contract and they're moving on, more often than not, we'd be saying, well, let's just rent vest or, or rent where we're living and go and invest somewhere where we can monitor the markets uh, around the country. But that's – so if I'm living in Adelaide at mm-hmm. the moment and yeah. I'm a doctor, trainee doctor, and then they're shipping me off to, I don't know, another part of the state mm-hmm. or country or whatever it is, yeah. Um, it, I think we need to – like I would always advise my clients when I was a financial advisor, like I don't want you buying a house to live in if you're not going to buy it, kind of be living there for at least five years. So, yeah. And then my second part of the question, John, is it can be scary. Like if you say to your parents, oh, I want to buy a house, mm. uh, but it's in Timbuktu, 3,000 kilometers away, Yeah, that's scary. Yeah, that's right. And, and there's the question of – the rent we're paying now versus what our mortgage would be when I buy something. So I spoke to someone a couple of weeks ago. They're paying $400 a week in rent and they were looking at buying a home in that same suburb. They were going to be there for the next 10 years uh, and their repayments were actually less than the mortgage, uh, than the rent that they were paying. So that led us down the path of of finding their owner-occupier home. Uh, but, yeah, definitely looking at the market. So the Adelaide example, is Adelaide a good market to buy in right now? If it is, great, that's a green light. Have we got the money? Is it uh, is it cheaper to hold that mortgage than to um, rent? Okay, there's another green light. But then if we're moving out of the area, can we rent that out? And is that going to be a good long-term investment is, is then the final piece to that. And then a follow-on question from that from Nicole. What differences make it better to buy an investment as opposed to a first home? Uh, probably all the things I just spoke about. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> oh, so- like, yeah, 
As opposed to if you're in the suburb and you're buying two homes side by like, side. It's a, well, it's a lifestyle play. Mm. So what differences make it better to buy an investment or yeah. a first home? And I'll, I'll go to Rach on this in a moment, but um, when we're rent vesting, we've got no bad debt. We've, we've, uh, we're renting somewhere, we're investing elsewhere, we haven't got our own mortgage, um, the, the running costs of our life um, are, are pretty lean and all the debt that we've got we can um, claim back against our taxable income. Um, so servicing obviously changes based on the level of debt we've got um, but Rach, do you want to add to that in terms of rent vesting versus having our own mortgage from a lending perspective? Um, well, there's the pros and cons for, for each. Obviously, if you're buying to live in, you get all of these, the grants that are mm. great. But I mean, I've had a number of clients that would forego the grant and they may be living at home with their parents, buying it as an investment property. Yes. And they're going to save a lot more than they would get in a grant by mm. not having to pay their mortgage. They've got somebody else renting that property and paying the mortgage while they've all, all of their, their debt is essentially tax deductible. Yeah. And they can probably still pay a cheaper level of board and still save. That's right. If the parents are keen to be part of this strategy. Mm. Absolutely. And even if they are renting with friends and buying an investment property, um, you know, tax-wise and otherwise it might be it might be better for them. So from a lender's perspective, um, obviously you've got the extra income of the rental income that you can use if it is an investment. Yeah. Um, but those rates might be cheaper if it is an owner-occupied yeah. As, yeah. as opposed to an investment. It's just a big game of chess, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think... Before these grants came along, like because I wasn't around when the grants were there, that's, that's yeah. how old I am, right? <laughs> they came in the year after. But a lot of people go and buy their home because it's the great Aussie dream. Mm. I'll go and buy what I can afford and I'll go and live 10K further out than where I'd like to, but that's what I can afford. That's what the bank will lend me, so I'll go and do it. Versus saying, well, no, I, I can actually think outside the square and live in the preferred suburb for X amount of rent per week and go and invest where I want to around the country. So we get a choice of of locations based on growth. But from a lifestyle point of view, we actually get to live where we want to live instead of living in somewhere where we could afford, but I don't really want to be here. Mm. Um, and that's where that great Aussie dream is a bit of a fallacy. That's right. That, and that's how I started in the market. I wanted to live on the Central Coast, which is where I worked, but I couldn't afford to buy here. So I went out and bought in Cessnock, my first property in 2003 so mm. you can and and that was at 97 percent with full mortgage insurance and yeah. um did you do all right out of it i did all right out of it yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you want to talk i want to talk i don't want to talk as much about strategy right now because as well there is another webinar i think rachel back with us in a couple of weeks and we're just doing a mortgage broker q a so we're going to just literally answer all questions mm. mortgage broker q a all Take level two, right? so this this webinar is kind of a beginner's entry level you're welcome to come back because you'll learn stuff and it's but it's going to be aimed more intermediate to advanced but i think um I don't know, I lost my train of thought. But let's talk about lending and mortgage broking because unless you're a trust fund kid um, and you can just buy a house with cash or get your parents to buy a house for you, I, I think you might need a, a bank or a lender. Mm. Okay, I like this one. Tamara asks, what are the red flags that banks look for in people applying for loans? Um, well, this has changed in, in recent years too. So the banks will look at... Um, they run a thing called a credit score and they will look at your current lending, past lending and also your transactional accounts. Um, so on top of your income, which is the servicing of your loan, they're going to look at your conduct of facilities but not just loans, also transactional accounts. So um, the red flags they would look for might be something like overdrawing your transactional account and you might have funds in another account but you are always sloppy with your transactions and they overdraw or your credit card might be paid a week late. Um, these sorts of things are actually going to show up when you do your application. Um, there's a new thing that's come out in the last probably two years. It's open credit reporting. So when you put an application in with the bank, they can actually see your, your history on all of your facilities for the last two years. And this is new. So they used to only be able to see something that was a negative mm. after 30 days late. But I've put an application in this week that um, they came back and asked a question about a GE credit line that had been closed being a week late 
last year. Wow. wow. So that's yeah. the detail that they can see. So mm. red flags would be just conduct. And it doesn't mean you won't get an application approved yeah. if you have it, but just making sure that you have everything in order. So generally they're requesting six months worth of bank statements. Is that fair? They shouldn't well, be going back any longer than that? No. Well, a lot of the, a lot of the lenders who are doing this open credit reporting aren't asking for bank statements. They just uh, well, they don't need it. See, they've got they don't, visibility. They can see, they've got full yeah. visibility. So we get it for our you know to help the clients work out their yeah. budgets and look yeah. at their spending. How, but the, some of the banks are they've got access to everything back two years. Because realistically, mm. John, they they're looking for your credit profile per se or character. Character. That's a better yeah. word. So it's like. Mm. You know, there's there's no such thing as a national credit score, right? Mm. Because there's three main credit reporting agencies or bureaus. Mm. And what the banks do, and Rach, a million years ago you worked at a bank. I did. So what the banks do, they might pull a report from each of the bureaus just to see what comes up and they just make their own assessment. Yeah. That's right. Like if someone's got um, afterpay, 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 that could be an issue. Yeah, and afterpay is seen as a. I mean, that's a that's a payday lender. Yes. So it, it actually can impact negatively to see people buying things that you know essentially they can't afford. Yeah. Zip pay and afterpay are, are you know they're telltale signs of you know maybe overspending. Put your hand up on the. Um, I just like the interaction. Put you your hand up if you want to hear a big zinger banger, which a lot of people haven't thought about. Like, yeah. So yeah, I need more hands raised, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to do a big zinger, big banger. So when everyone learned that they can, and Rachel will know this, John might not as much, um, not questioning you as a person, just you're not a mortgage broker. Carry on. When this whole super scheme thing was like, you can withdraw money from super, so many people were like, I'm withdrawing 10 grand now and 10 grand after July and I'm going to put that towards a deposit on my home. The lenders now are saying you are in financial distress because you actually had to access super early release. Mm. Red flag, baby. Absolutely. Because mm. And as well, not genuine savings because it hasn't been sitting in your account yeah. for three months. That's right. And one of the big banks just came out to say, no, they won't, they won't accept people that have just recently withdrawn. Yeah. Because you're in financial distress. On paper, mm. sure, you've gained the system, you've got your little 10 grand out. Thought you were smart. Yeah. And, again, we don't want to make fun of you because there are – but it's just, again, it's always worth just getting advice before you pull the trigger on anything because it can have effects that flow on. Just back on the credit report, you've um, you've got to keep checking that thing, don't you? Like I've just recently went for a, a loan and – 2016, we sold a property and the loan was still appearing on the score, on the history. That can happen. Uh, even though there was no debt there, there was no visible statements or anything. So we had to get that removed, took 30 days, but essentially it was holding holding up proceedings because it was sitting there for some stupid reason because the lender didn't flick it on. Yeah, and that, and that can be seen as an undisclosed debt. So, mm. if it, mm. But once you can show it's closed... Um, yeah, but learning curve for me once again yes. was keep checking it to make sure there's someone's yeah. hadn't uh, labelled something on there that needs to go. And you should have control of your credit file. That is something mm. that you should check and, and have a look at and make sure there's nothing on there that's not expected. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we need to keep moving. Candace asks, what sort of debt will impact your application? So can you talk to us, Rach, about hex and help debt if it's a showstopper or not? Oh, it's definitely not a showstopper, but it is something that like a like any sort of loan that has to be taken into to account. So when we're working out how much you can borrow, obviously the help debt that you're paying comes off your, your income. Um, so having a help debt's fine. It's fine to get a mortgage while you've got a help debt. Um, you just need to be able to afford the mortgage long term using that help debt. Even if you only have a year left of it, of mm. the help debt, you have to be able to afford it over the 30-year term with the help debt there the whole time. Mm. So are you a fan of paying some of it down or just letting it do its thing and saving for a deposit? Oh, it, it depends on everybody's, you know, individual circumstance. Yeah. But um, there's worse debt than help debt. Yeah. So I think things like, you know, credit cards and afterpay mm. would tend to have a higher interest rate and be have more impact. And, yeah. it, and it goes back to the start, like where I said, it's important that you do clean up your debt where possible because 
broad brushstroke, $10,000 personal loan could affect your borrowing by up to $40,000. 100%. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's just good to know. That's right. And credit cards, uh, just while we're on, on that debt, they're always treated mm. as fully drawn mm. in yes. applications. So you might have a $20,000 credit card that you pay out mm. monthly, you never pay interest on it, but when we're putting an application in, you still have to treat that as if it's fully drawn. Yeah. So some people, we do sometimes reduce credit card limits um, even if they aren't used, just to to be able to to yep. make it look All a bit right. better light. And just on this, um, someone asked, do the grants can't see you know, uh, Stin, I think your name is. Uh, do the grants count towards your deposit? Pretty much, yes. Yeah, especially towards your funds to complete. Yes, um, but not towards the the genuine savings that you you may need to oh, qualify for yeah. the, yeah, that the only. So, yeah. and I think that's important to note. Like, you probably do need at least five percent genuine savings mm. in your account for three months um, Generally, there are some banks and lenders that will allow the, re- the rent that you're paying yes. through, a, through a managing like a proper real estate agent um, will allow that to be used as genuine savings. There are different guidelines around that yep. um, and some will um, and some don't need genuine savings at certain mm. levels. So there's a question here from Madison and some in question the questions that have come in I've just turn the thing on so you can upvote them. Madison asks a small inheritance towards the deposit. Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah. It won't count towards genuine savings, but it will count towards funds to complete. So yeah. how much money you actually need to. So complete. that could be if Madison's renting, we might find a lender that can use the yes. rent as genuine savings and then mm. we can complete with the 50 grand or whatever that is. 100%. Mm, so you take the genuine savings with rent and then the funds to complete are from inher- yeah. inheritance. Mm. Yeah, Go so on. there's an, an anonymous question here. How much would you, and I think we might just start to go to some questions, but I want to do a case study. We are running out of time, but I think it's been quite valuable. Uh, Anonymous says, how much would you recommend in a savings up uh, just for a deposit? Five, 10, 20, 30. I mean, you've got to have at least 5% to come to the party, don't you? Unless it's a parental guarantee. Unless it's Mm. a parental guarantee. But, so mm. I don't think there's a set amount no. because it's no. different for everybody mm. and what options and mm. other lifelines you've got You've got to weigh that interest rate up, don't you, as Absolutely. well? But yeah. obviously what a lot of people don't think about is if I put down 5% only, that's great. The banks lend 95 but the loan repayments on that are far greater than if I put down 15%, for example. So yes. knowing that you can service that, number one, and um, continue on. Is it Alexis asks, is it worth shopping around for a broker and seeing a few before choosing to one to go with or is there no real difference as uh, all would have similar channels and kind of know what they're doing? I mean, Loaded gun this John, one. Well, <laughs> I think John Shane, I, I'm biased. You John no, one. John and I have spoken about this before. I don't – I would say as a human nature thing, like if you have a conversation with a new car mechanic, a new – chiropractor and you broker and you walk away from that meeting with some weird gut feeling that you're not 100 percent sure mm. maybe there's a problem but you call rachel's team they get back to you they you feel confident they're well referred or recommended by us i don't know if you're going to need to talk to any other brokers i don't know Rach. i don't feel that i would be shocked if anybody did go to the phone book to get a mortgage broker i feel like that's something that they're guiding you through and a really big transaction, a really big investment. I would, I would personally not use a mortgage broker that hadn't been recommended, um, and generally that might be from you know somebody else that you know and that's mm. had a good experience. Mm. So if if that's the case, no, there'd be no reason to shop them, mm. um, or if you weren't comfortable. Yeah. But, um, I mean, they all have the you know essentially the same products available to them. It's just who you're comfortable with. Yeah, yeah. Um, Matt asks, what do you do after you've saved your deposit? Have a chat to a broker and <laughs> yeah. get them. Uh, and I think going back to what we were talking about earlier, actually contact a broker before you think you've saved enough so you can get the ball rolling and get a vision board as to, okay, if I save this amount, this is what I can yeah. lend. And we don't mind. We don't mind talking to somebody six months or 12 months before they buy. Yeah. Mm. Um, and that's something that we do, you know, just knowing that that's a client that's going to come back to us down the track. But don't be scared to ask the questions before you're ready. Mm. Um and this is a bit of a taste of what the next webinar will be like because we've we used a lot of this webinar to talk about the grants and some structural things, uh, but we're just going to have all these types of questions. Um, I like this one. Um, Livia asks, any advice for purchasing a home with a partner, first home with a partner? And I just thought I'd add in a friend. So if you want to buy with a friend, 
from a lender's point of view, Rachel, any major issues that the lenders will look at? Um, if you're buying with a partner or a friend, obviously you've got you know, the, maybe the ability to borrow more because you've got both of your incomes involved. And I think for the initial transaction, it always seems to be great. But a, um, I guess a, like a, a flag that has come up in the past, if you're buying with somebody who isn't your partner, maybe it's a sibling or a friend, when you go to buy the next time, if that person isn't on that application, the lenders look at the entire debt being yours because that other person that you bought with before isn't going on your new application. So they have to look at that entire debt being yours. Mm. And if it is a rental property, they can only use half the rent. So it can cause a complexity for your next transaction. There's a, a lot of lenders starting to stray away from that now though, aren't there? A lot of not just taking 50% of the ownership, 100% of the debt, they're actually going 50-50? Um, it, in our experience, a lot of them will want the hundred percent of the debt because mm. technically they can't assess the other person. Yeah. Um, yeah. Privacy. And, and the other, I suppose, to that question is a lot around. It's essentially a joint venture, so making sure that you've got your agreements in place and your expectations mm. clear. Yeah, I always say have the chat. What happens mm. if one of you doesn't want to be part of this whole thing anymore? Is it yeah. like, okay, well, I've got the first right to buy you out yeah. and if we can't get a solution within three months, yeah. we've got to sell the property, like just to have some real talk. Yeah. But if it means getting into the market, sometimes it's a great solution. Yeah. If it's, it's awesome. right for them. Yeah, I love it. Remember that? <laughs> Remember that guy, we won't say his name, clearly, um, <laughs> that they bought up here with a mate up on the main road a million years ago. Anyway, you might not remember, and with a friend, and they sold it, and the property market went, and they both regret it. So we'll talk later. Um, <laughs> anonymous, Good chat, you too. Yeah, thanks. Oh, hey everyone, <laughs> didn't, didn't see you there. Um, anonymous asks, how do you deal with a situation in which both partners have unequal deposits? Oh, yeah, that's a good one, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. I I don't know what you feel about this, Rach, but I would go. There's two options for this one. You either set up the agreement in the relative percentages. So if I've put in 60%, they put in 40%, it's a 60-40 split. Or it's a 50-50 split, but that person has to um, contribute that remainder amount that they should have to get it up to 50 over the duration. Do you have any comments? I tend to refer people to their solicitor to have a little chat about that and mm. put, it, put around. I tend not to give advice on... On that, but generally, if someone's putting in, you know, a substantial amount more, you'd want that documented in one way or another. Yeah, and it's, oh, it's uh, absolutely got to be documented, yeah. doesn't it? And call me old-fashioned. I mean, please, <laughs> call, go on, Rach. He, Say, hate, oh. he hates JVs for a start, <laughs> so he's, <laughs> no, no, uh, no. he's going to smash. But I mean, this. let's see. Like, if one partner's got more, and I'm talking about romantic partner, like if you've been living <laughs> together for what is like eighteen months, two years, anyway. You're considered de facto anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. I, I I took it as not partner, partner. I took it as yeah, JV. Yeah, especially with investors, you'd have a lot of clients that have, yeah, yeah. Mm, people yeah. that aren't yeah. romantic yeah. partners. Yeah. Well, it just says both partners have money. Anyway, it's complicated. See a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and a marriage counsellor. And a marriage counsellor. <laughs> or me. I'll, I'll give you some advice. Yeah. Plan for um, the out before you go in. Now, <laughs> I want to now move on to just some self-employed sole traders, casual and single incomes. Um, yeah, so Laura asked, how much percent do you need if you're a sole trader? So it, the amount saved doesn't really matter if you're a sole trader or an employee, does it? See, this changed with COVID. Right. So we're in some uncharted territories. Yes. But before COVID, it would be absolutely no difference. Right. Um, it's about funds to complete and serviceability. So your income, whether you're the, you're the director of a company or or trust or a sole trader would be no different to if you are an employee. Um, it's just about what your income is and the deposit would be no different. Since COVID, some of the requirements have changed. So one of the major banks that have a number of other lenders underneath them have actually said, we won't lend to anybody who's self-employed, even if you're a secondary applicant, over 80%. So, mm. And that's only one lender. So if you're in that situation where you've had that said to you, it doesn't mean that there's not another 20 lenders at will, but they are, and there's some of the lenders that are asking for some, just some extra things like, you know, bad statements and trading statements just to show that everything is still on track. Um, but generally it's no different. Yeah. Banging on about the value of a mortgage broker, if, if someone walked off the street and went into that one lender, 
they could have said, well, yeah, I, I can't go and lend and, and that's it and just um, shut the door, right? And so, that's right. And it could be a quality per, like a quality person that yeah. would think that they'd have no problems with um, having a mortgage. If you're borrowing 85% and mm. you know, great incomes, you could have that come up against yeah. you and mm. you'd be shocked. Yeah. And I think it's important. Um, I want to talk about, and Georgia asked, can you please talk about securing a mortgage working in a casual job? Yeah. What's so, the deal there? I mean, a lot of a lot of people are, are casual, and a lot of um, our clients are casual, and sometimes it's both of them that are casual. Mm. Um, it's just about what the lenders will take. So some want six months casual, some want twelve months. Mm. Um, a lot of the time, you know, that that income gets shaded to cover things like leave, but you can still borrow if you're a casual employee. Yeah. I, I just want to, if Nate, can you go to the iPad, please? I think it's so important that there's two sides of this coin and if you look at my wonderful drawing when you are borrowing money to buy a house and this is a bank vault everyone okay so we'll just it's got a big handle on it it's a great vault yeah so the bank say we will lend you money to buy the house but we need to have you know and i'll just call it a a deposit a percentage of money so we're not lending the whole amount so, which is you need capital to do that. But the other side of the coin is if you've got all the money in the world saved and don't have a job, you don't have, you know, if this is you, you've got to have a job to service the actual mortgage. So, for single transitioning into uh, people who might be single and want a mortgage, they might have a deposit saved. So, it ticks this side of the fence, but their income might be lower than a couple and they might not have that side of the equation so there's there's kind of two parts to this in terms of when you want to get a loan so any tips or examples of single people wanting to buy a, uh, a property um so a single person could still buy a property yeah on their own um and obviously one person earning say a hundred thousand dollars actually has a little bit less net income than two people on 50 because of tax rates, but there's also so less true. living expenses mm. true, because it's true. only one. So it would probably be similar what they could borrow. So singles can be um, not – like you might have a better income as a single but punished by the bank because of yeah. you're single. Well, you, you can be because of the tax rate, but yeah. obviously the, the living expenses are less than with a couple. So everyone, so- download Bumble, Tinder, Hinge, <laughs> download it now. Get into the Facebook group, say I'm single and we'll hook you up. Yeah, I, I actually had a um, case a couple of weeks ago where the partner was a detriment to the loan because of their debts and their their income levels. Um, so basically they had to be removed from their life and uh, <laughs> they weren't on the title, they weren't on the loan and they didn't exist. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not always two is better than one. But, but also speaking to that, don't go just down to your local branch at a shopping center and say, I want to buy a house and let them put an application in and try and approve it or whatever because if you do that and one of you in a re- relationship or you as a single, they put the application in and say, no, decline, sorry, mm. then in two months' time you go to a mortgage broker and say, oh, if you just didn't put that application in, it wouldn't have shown on your credit. So that's why it's so important to go to a switch it on broker to have a chat, see which way the wind's blowing and then like your team would know, Rach, that single person, that much savings, this much income, we know these couple of lenders are probably going to be more favourable than the one in the local shopping centre. Yeah, and you, you obviously want to put it up for the the one that's going to be the most favourable at the first the first time as well. Yeah. Do you get do you get many drongos come in that have already put in loan applications with another lender and <clears throat> excuse me got knocked back and now you've got to try and wipe the slate clean? All the time. I wouldn't call them drongos. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> John. You can't but even edit that no, out. No one's no one listening is in oh, that category. Yeah, sure. But yeah. Yeah. we would have a, a uh, we would have a regular <laughs> amount of clients that would come and they've had um yeah their their application declined in the branch and we're grateful to get those clients because a lot of the time you know we wouldn't get to meet that client if mm. they didn't have that application declined and then they have a perfectly you know, great history. It's just that that one particular lender, mm. something didn't fit their policy. Yeah, so it's not game over for them. No, not at all. No. It's If one lender won't do it, there's, there's 27 in the bag. So mm. we just have to look at what's going to suit their needs best. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if you want to 
open the Q and A, everyone, and you can upvote in the five minutes we got left. Uh, Anonymous says fixed uh, versus variable rate, pros and cons of each, especially in the current market. Like, what? I mean, we know with a fixed rate, you are guaranteed certainty for the fixed period. So if you did take a five year fixed loan, it's your first mortgage. You know, for the next five years, I know my mortgage is going to be this much. Yes. So that's a given. Do you guys have any general comment? Like, I'll confess at the moment, my all mine are on um, principal and interest payments and variable. Yeah, Rachel rounded it all off uh, with some expertise, but I, I would say, generally speaking, the last twenty years for me is always been variable, um, but. It's the lowest interest rates I've seen in the last 20 years as well. So it's it's now that I'm questioning whether I, I fix a portion of it, right? But I'm, I still need some convincing. But I think it's a case-by-case case based on someone's risk profile, their how secure their jobs are, how many dependents they got, how many assets they got, the whole range of things. That's right. And a lot changes in five years. And if you want to nice. change properties or upgrade or something like that, I know we don't want to – sell your property but if you want to refine four years or three years mm. you kind of have a break cost and that can be substantial especially if you were fixed for five years i've yeah. seen break costs up to forty thousand dollars yeah wow Ooh. um so i guess to i mean fix generally you wouldn't fix to save money generally you'd fix as you said glenn for certainty of what you were going to be repaying mm. um but they've both got their they've both got pros and cons yeah. um and if in doubt talk to your broker uh, they can maybe do half half yeah and we absolutely. haven't even got into strategy with offset accounts and all that because mm. your broker will talk to you about that and we might do that in the q a webinar yeah um but there's another question here from anonymous that's been upvoted the most uh how much cash slash buffer should i have left over after i put a deposit down for my first home <sighs> put it all in just uh <laughs> <laughs> john no yeah, you'd like to have three months, wouldn't you? But sometimes it's not that practical when you're working hard to get your first deposit through. That's right, and more often than not, like it would be great to say it's always good to keep five thousand out as a you know as a slush account. Yeah, but if it's the difference of putting that five thousand in and not paying twenty thousand mortgage insurance, yeah, you're going right. to put it all in yeah. to be able to um you know to get that the cost of getting in as down as much as possible. Yeah, mm. I, I look at how much someone's saving per month. And say, so, well, okay, if they've got two grand a month they're saving, three months they'll have six grand. Can we replenish that buffer pretty quickly? Or is it going to take 12 months to repay? And I don't think it, it's all got to do with, as I said earlier, life's full of risks. How risk averse are you? Like, I personally think in a perfect world, sure, if you can have three months worth of expenses, or if it's 15 grand, 10 grand, 20 grand, whatever that is in your world, get that sorted put it away mm. because someone asked me the other day, they emailed me and said, um, I lost my job at during COVID at this time. I had an emergency fund. Should I put that towards my home deposit? And I said, well, let's just fast forward. If you had put that emergency fund into your home, then COVID hit and you lost your job the next week, you'd have no cash in your life. Mm. That's a big emotional mm -hmm. weight that, I personally don't want to cover, uh, go through myself. No. But sure, if like you said, John, we can save, you know, ordinarily we can save a grand a week, but over the next two months, if we want to shuffle a few things around, we land and we're a bit lean for a, a month. Mm. Again, it goes back to risk level, doesn't yeah, it? Sure. So the right answer is as much as possible. Um, we'll answer two more questions. Just put your hand up, everyone, if we can answer two more questions, five minutes. Um, and then we'll let you go to bed. And I'm going to, uh, personally, I bought Law & Order SVU Season 18. It's a few years old now. <laughs> haven't watched a few years. I'm going to watch an episode of that after we finish here tonight. Love that show. Um, Naomi says, uh, pros and cons of buying a unit instead of a freestanding house and land for a first home to live in with intent to rent it out down the track. It'd be no different to we're in my garage at the moment. No real different than my strategy, is it? Uh, no, 
I would check out one website for you. What was her name, sorry? Naomi. Naomi. Uh, sqmresearch.com.au will give you the vacancy rates by postcode anywhere around the country, units versus houses. Uh, you'll get a general look at what's happening in the market. Um, oh, I was just going to say with vacancy rate, it could be different in five years' time than it is now. Yeah, and it's interesting when you look at it, it should give you a 10-year trend where that trend's going. And and I know in Sydney at the moment, a lot of unit apartment trends are actually going like this, if anyone can see, mm. um, like Qantas is taking off. So which is in not their, the, in their dream. <laughs> not so much. No, actually, and I want to say if you are in the airline industry, we totally, like if we can help in any way, I don't know how we mm. can help, but um, if you want any type of support or whatever, just email us or mm. um, reach out because that industry is... Just yeah, it's not a good one. Being moment. slammed, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so check that out, especially if you're going to rent it out. But even if you're not, uh, essentially that generally means an oversupply of the product mm. within that postcode. Yeah, and I think for me personally, like I'm in a three-bedded townhouse. Um, I never really have any plans of selling this. I know I won't be here long-term, although I don't mind the area, um, but I might grow out of it one day. Um, I bought this with the intent to, you know, buy it, loved it, and then later on I'll move out and turn it into an investment property. Um, but again, it goes back to to strategy. Sophie asks, can you check your credit file too often? No, in fact, I've got an Equifax um, membership, I think it is, and it's like 15 bucks a month and every month they send me a, a thing, a report, and they also alert me if there's been activity on it. Right. So if someone, if they go, oh, Glenn, you've applied for... And it, get this, where's my phone? So weird. And I think it's obviously not your office, Rach, but a, a less qualified broker somewhere in Australia has put down my mobile number in someone else's because I get these text messages. We're ready to settle your loan. Please contact your solicitor. <laughs> no. um, thank you for choosing Commonwealth Bank. And I got a message today at 1 p.m. Congratulations, your home loan settlement is complete. Uh, thank you for choosing Commonwealth Bank. Mm. So I don't know if it's spam or whatever, but um, so but if they did apply and were fraudulent on my credit, uh, I think it was Sophie, I would get a notification and then I could jump onto it rather than in five years' time wanting to get a loan. I said, oh, back in 2020, you applied for this. I'm like, no, I didn't. So you can kind of keep yeah. on top yeah. of it. There you go. And can I don't think you can access your own credit file too much but you can make your own credit file too busy. Exactly. Yeah, and that's bad. where credit scoring comes in and yes. it can be too busy if mm. you have multiple yeah. multiple inquiries. And like but that's not you doing it, that's another person. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like I've got a credit card balance transfer every 6 months to yeah. kick the can down the road. No, just pay the bastard off. Interest isn't your problem. It's the amount that's your problem and with so much respect and I've been here before so I can say this. The problem isn't your credit card. The problem is system, systemic overspending in your life mm. for a prolonged period of time. Mm. I've been there. I don't know these guys are perfect. Yeah, but no, I've been there. So, but it's mm. just like we're here now. We've got to clean up our our act. Yeah. Um, and here's probably a really good last question: When meeting a mortgage broker for the first time, what questions should somebody ask? Um. I'd want to know, I guess, what that what that mortgage broker, if they, I mean, it's going to be different because every transaction is going to be different. But if you were a first home buyer, um, I mean, I'd want to know, you know, what that what that broker's philosophies are on on you know where I should you know what I should be doing or whether they have experience in things like parental guarantees or uh, you know are you experienced with first home buyers? Mm. Um, do you write the majority of one bank or or whatever? But I think that if um, you know, once the broker knows your information, it's going to be a lot easier for them mm. to, t to give you the right um, information too. Yeah, mm. I'd probably say for the first home buyer because for me, I, I get fearful and worried if I don't understand the process. So the question could be, hey, you know, I am keen to look, can you actually just talk me through what the actual process is for this whole home loan thing? How long will it take? What information do you need from me? Um how often should I hear back from you? Like, you know, and this is the problem. We all send an email in and then two minutes later we want to reply. You know, everyone's busy, but it's just like 
yeah, if you email us, we'll get back to you within a day or something like that. So, I think there's no silly question and I think if you ask and I would actually recommend before you go to the broker and because Rachel's team, if you want to uh, reach out to Rachel's team, they work all over Australia, maybe you could write um, in your notepad, just do a brain dump of questions. I've got all these questions and then just ask the broker. Absolutely. So we would get into the office and see emails with clients that we may have had a brief chat to and they you know, go and, and maybe speak to their parents or their friends and come back to us with 20 questions in bullet points. And, I mean, that's our that's what we do. We go back and we mm-hmm. answer them. And it makes you, I think, an informed client or customer that's empowered uh, to make their own decision based on the information that they've been educated with from the broker mm-hmm. makes a better client for the broker anyway because yes. there's buy-in. Yeah. It's not just, oh, tell me what to do. Yeah, I'll do that. Take an it's ownership, this, haven't they? It's a long-term relationship, mm. yeah. It is a long-term relationship and it might start well before they buy. Mm. Yeah. So let's – um, we might wrap it up there. I've had a lot of fun tonight. Mm. Um, a couple of things. These are kind of the key takeaways just in prepping this and it's probably changed since I prepped this. You want to just make sure you have solid cash flow system in place just in your life. That's public service announcement because getting a mortgage, it actually only adds pressure if you're not used to it. So we're all first home buyers here. So make sure you can have a system in place. Um, get information from a broker on your exact situation. So that's so important. I think that's the biggest thing. Reach out to Rage's team. And just start the conversation. You might not be ready to buy. There's 30% of you who aren't ready to buy uh, within the next six months. Have the conversation in the next couple of weeks. You know what I mean? Just get the ball rolling. Yeah. Just I think it's great to you, for your goal setting, isn't it? Mm. To know what's out there. Is mm. it 12 months away? Is it two years based mm. on my savings? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then thirdly, if you are kind of thinking, oh, I, you know, I don't know if I want to buy or rent vest and I just want someone who isn't my parents or my siblings that might not get my wokeness um, and you want to bounce some information. What's wokeness? What's wokeness? <laughs> Google that later, John. You're not woke enough. You're not woke, John. <laughs> not, not woke. Yeah. Um, you know, you can jump onto sortyourmoneyout.com, fill out the form and John has, we call them a clarity call. You'll get maybe up to 45 minutes an hour. You can fill out some information before. Just bounce your stuff, third party, no um, no issues at all. And uh, he charges three thirty for that. And I think the testimonies that we've had have been well worth it. Um, if you want to take a photo of the next slide, and if you're in the My Millennial Money community, um, I'll get you to throw that up, Nath. Um, these are some webinars coming up uh, on the th- in a couple of weeks. We're back with Rach. I think for two weeks running and then later in August, we're going to have a, a personal insurance Q&A and we've also got a health insurance Q&A coming up. Um, this is the photo of the slide that you will want to take a photo of and we might email tomorrow this link. Um, if you don't want to reach out to Rachel and her team, if you just go to sphefinance.com.au forward slash M3, you can fill out the information there and it's just put it through. They'll get back to you. Um, I think we said make sure you get back to people within 10 business hours, but there's hundreds and hundreds of people that are watching tonight. So <laughs> Next fill that week. out and in the coming days, uh, Rach's team will just get back to you, book in a time just to have a chat. We just want you to be informed and be encouraged. Mm. Uh, and Rach is in the trenches too, writing loans herself. So, yeah, so that, Rach, that's a critical part, yeah, I reckon. Yeah, so mm. Rach, um, she's got a team of people uh, on the coast where we are. They've got multiple office locations. It's not a kid's birthday party. It's a legitimate functioning big team of people to help uh, clients and listeners mm. all over Australia. We do have a panel of quality professionals and mm. um there's so many people who want to get on our panel, but we're very selective of who we refer you to. Mm. So she's make a sure- mother. She has run birthday parties before. She has run birthday parties mm. before. We might leave it there. Uh, thank you so much, Rachel Croon. Thank you, Rach. Thank you. And for, Great. For coming in. And I've had a lot of fun. Yeah, same. And everyone's got their hands raised. I guess everyone's clapping. Um, <laughs> Yay. It's not the bird, is it? No, it's definitely not the bird. 
Um, and remember, you can join us in the My Millennial Money Facebook group if you're not in there already. If you're new to our whole world, welcome. We run a podcast and there will be a audio version of this uh, session that will go up later this week, I think on Wednesday. And the part that Nathan pressed record on for the <laughs> webinar. And thanks, Nathan. Come put your headphones down, leave camera one on, and we're just going to say... <laughs> Thanks to Nath. Thanks for recording, Nath. Oh, we're going to move that. Come in and sit here for the family photo. Oh, <laughs> come around the, the back. Oh, hang on. What's going on? <laughs> How are we? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nath, for all your work. No whackers. Good to be here. Are you going to press record next time? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I hope you enjoyed your last day of work. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a pleasure you uh, working with us. Um but hey, and that's that's the risk. Like people say, other replays. I'm like, if if there is, there is. Technology is not working. All right, guys. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, John. Thank you, Rage. I've got some Law and Order to watch. Yeah. So we'll, uh, right. we'll see you soon. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Bye. Bye.